I'm the Doctor. I'm a Time Lord. I'm from the planet Galathrae in the constellation of Casterberus. I'm 903 years old and I'm the man who's going to save your lives and all six billion people on the planet below. He's a grumpy demon Crowley and a gambling Casanova. Touching Romeo and sociopathic villain Kilgrave, the surly detective Alec Hardy, and of course, the inimitable Tenth Doctor. David Tennant is one of the most versatile actors of our time, able to transform into any character. But what's he like in real life? Today on the Biographer Channel, we will try to figure it out. How did he become the father of his wife? Why doesn't he use social networks? And how did he manage to get that dream role? Get comfortable, we're starting. And it is gonna be... Fantastic. David John MacDonald was born on April 18, 1971 in Bathgate, Scotland. He became the third child in the family of a charity employee, Helen and Alexander Sandy MacDonald, a minister in the Church of Scotland. David spent his childhood years in Paisley. Here, Sandy worked as a priest in the local church. One day, three-year-old David saw on TV the cult British series Doctor Who. The show is about a Time Lord who travels in his spaceship disguised as a blue police box. It's impossible to kill him. Getting a mortal wound, this hero is reborn in a new body every time. Tennant's first memory of the series was the episode when the third Doctor, played by John Pertwee, regenerated into the fourth, Tom Baker. I saw it as futuristic and scientific, and at the same time all a bit hand-knitted, Tennant said. Something about that appealed. It always felt he only needed a ball of string to save everything. And of course, this great character who just burns through the middle with enthusiasm and glee, and you can absolutely trust him, and yet you never quite predict what he's going to do. The amazing adventures of the charismatic alien and his companions fascinated the boy so much that he decided to become an actor when he grows up. So that one day he can go on a trip himself in a blue police box. I was very small, about three or four I think, and just wanted to be the people on telly telling these wonderful stories. Obviously the idea grew and matured with me, but I can't ever remember wanting to do anything else. I've just sort of taken it for granted all my life that that was what I would do. The boy had a decent age difference with his brother Blair and sister Karen, six and eight years. But little David didn't feel lonely, he could always think of something to do. According to him, the realization that he wants to play has penetrated into his daily life. I think it was pretending to be other people and telling stories, because that's what I'd do in the back garden all the time. I'd sort of rove around talking to myself, being all the different characters. He recalled, When the parents found out about their son's dream, they advised him to find a more practical job. But over the years, his love for acting has not passed, but on the contrary, has become stronger. His first public appearance was in a school play called Gypsum's Journey. The boy played the role of a goblin in green tights and a hat, which, to his disappointment, he could not take home. His parents saw how, in his own words, absurdly purposeful David was, and did not stop him from achieving his dreams. The actor believes that this confidence, which he lost a little when he grew up, is connected with his upbringing. It was his parents who instilled in him the belief that nothing is impossible. They were liberal, progressive Christians. They didn't allow the fact that they had a belief system to limit them. His mother and father gave David a moral compass, which he is guided by to this day. And even though they are no longer alive, Tennant still feels like they are sitting on his shoulder, reminding him to be better. I'm a good person, I hope, but I'm never as good as I want to be, never as nice as I want to be, never as generous as I want to be. Did Sandy want his son to become a priest like him? David says no. All the children went their separate ways, and the parents were fine with that. Moreover, when he became a professional actor, his father was very interested in his son's work. David believes that being a minister is sort of like acting, and his dad has always been supportive. Alexander told his son that if he had grown up in a slightly different place, in slightly different circumstances, and at a slightly different time, he might have become an actor too. Many years later, Alexander MacDonald would appear in a non-speaking role in Doctor Who, the series that made his son famous. I was coming down to visit David, and uh, I think they must have been short of someone, but they very kindly invited me to play the part of a footman. Sidecar, please. And a lime soda, thank you. Which has been interesting, and I didn't have to learn any lines. So that was good news. But it's still a long time before that. So far, David has tried his hand at productions of the Saturday Youth Theatre Club and continued to get carried away with Doctor Who, trying not to miss a single episode. As a child, Tennant even had a little doll of the fourth Doctor and a similar long scarf. Tom Baker is still an idol for him. 
People think I'm kidding when I say this, but I really do believe that his Doctor Who is one of the all-time great performances, he said in a recent interview. I think it was for everyone in my generation, growing up. It was just part of the cultural furniture in Britain in the 70s and 80s. I've always been a geek and slightly awkward. I was never the cool kid at school. One day, the guy managed to talk to Tom Baker at an autograph signing event in Glasgow. One can imagine the delight of a man who has been obsessed with the Doctor since childhood. Under the impression of the series at the age of 14, he wrote an essay called Intergalactic Overdose. David received his education at Ralston Primary School and Paisley Grammar School. He didn't like school in his teenage years. It's not that studying was a continuous torture for him. The boy had decent grades. David's English was the best. So if it wasn't for acting, he could have become an English teacher or a writer. But he had already chosen his life's work and believed that he was wasting his time on subjects that did not interest him. I was spotty with greasy hair and pretty pissed off. I couldn't wait to get the drama of college so that my life could get going. David's teenage years were a swamp of fashion mistakes, including a pink jumper that he wore for years until someone told him it was terrible. At 15, he wore a paisley shirt, skinny tie, and cropped jacket combo. Once, he was even beaten by other children because they did not like his appearance. Interestingly, what would they say if they found out that this boy would be recognized as one of the most stylish actors in his adulthood? I was never one of the cool kids who could customize their uniform and make it look good and everything, David recalled. I just had my seven years out of date hand-me-down shirts with 70s collars for my brother, and you never grow out of that feeling. Tennant's screen debut was at school. He was only 16 years old when he played in an anti-smoking film made for television in schools. The following year, David played a role in an episode of the children's anthology series, Dramarama. After graduating from school, he continued his acting studies at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama. Moreover, he became one of the youngest students in his course, having entered there at the age of 17. Around the same period, David MacDonald turns into David Tennant. The fact is that when the young actor was going to join the British Actors Union Equity, he was informed that a person with the surname MacDonald was already registered in the association. Then he had to look for a pseudonym. Yeah, but if you remember, we tried to persuade you to maybe go to a family. Thing. Yes, I do yeah. remember that, but I think at 16 I wasn't having any of that. Well, because parents, when you're 16, parents know nothing, of course. Quite right, quite right. 16 year olds know everything. Did you, you wanted nothing. me to be McLeod, didn't you? Well, you could have used McLeod, you could have used Blair, you could have used any of those names, mm. you know. I mean, I, I, asking a 16 year old to change their name, yeah. I, I mean, in that me I could have been anything. Bojangles McDuff. I mean, it really... <laughs> One day, flipping through a music magazine, David saw that there the lead singer of the pet shop boys group, Neil Tennant. The actor thought that Tennant was a good surname and decided to borrow it from the musician. David Tennant graduated in 1991 and almost immediately joined the touring left-wing theater group 784. It got its name from the statistics of 1966, according to which 7% of the UK population owned 84% of the national wealth. But it wasn't politics that attracted him to this troupe. It was just that David was lucky to get a job offer from them, and after drama school, that was all he sort of cared about. By a happy coincidence, their ideals corresponded to what he believed in, but an aspiring actor would have accepted the job, even if he didn't like something. The first professional work of the young actor was the staging of The Irresistible Rise of Arturo Yui. If you think that everything went smoothly for a talented guy right away, you are mistaken. His first roles got criticism. One of the reviews even brought him to tears. I was playing King Arthur in Edinburgh, which was only my second job, and the review in The Scotsman said, The cast of 18 are uniformly excellent with the exception of David Tennant, who lacks any charm or ability whatsoever, which I have to say floored me for quite a while. Now the actor tries not to read reviews. He believes that reviews aren't really for the people who are performing and, good or bad, they don't help. You always get a sense if something you're in has been well received or not. That's unavoidable, but beyond that, Details are best avoided. David's attempts to take local television by storm were also not particularly successful at first. He once joked after 16 auditions that he was the only Scottish actor alive who hasn't been in Taggart, one of the longest running series in the history of British television. When you start out, everyone tells you actors don't make a living, but you always think you'll be alright and that it'll be everyone else that won't work. Then, when I left drama school, I didn't get a job for about six weeks. I was abjectly skint. No prospects at all, staring into the abyss. Then I got lucky, got a job, and began picking up all kinds of ludicrous gigs to pay the bills. In the end, he managed to get his first roles on Scottish television. 
For example, the actor played a small but memorable role of transgender barmaid called Davina in the sitcom Rab C. Nesbitt. One of the first major film works of the actor was the miniseries Taken Over the Asylum in 1993. Tennant got his role due to the fact that a year earlier on the set of an episode of the drama Strathblair, he was able to impress director David Blair with his performance. The series told of a radio station based in the psychiatric department of a hospital. David played a teenager with a manic depressive disorder. Because we're going to show them. We are loonies and we are proud! Say it! We, we are loonies and we are proud! In an interview, the actor said that this role changed his life. They needed someone who could believably act 19 and bonkers. And David did it perfectly. This emotional, charismatic character cannot but arouse sympathy. And what characters do you like in David's performance? Share your opinion in the comments. On the set of the film, Tennant met Arabella Weir, an actress and writer. They became such friends that David later became the godfather of your youngest child. And it was in the Weir house that he rented a room when he moved to London in 1993 in search of new career opportunities. <laughs> Remembering what David was like in the 90s, Arabella Weir said that he had steely determination. It's funny this quote is always brought up and I don't feel very steely, the actor replied. I imagine she'd say it's about a determination of purpose, which I can't deny. Certainly, in terms of being an actor, I was very single-minded. That didn't feel steely to me. I guess Arabella would say I'm swatty, you see. I make sure I learn my lines. No matter how modest David was, from the outside it seemed that he had more than enough steel. If a few years after moving, he was able to get into the prestigious Royal Shakespeare Company, whose members were many famous British actors. David's debut was in 1996, in the staging of As You Like It. Critics noticed him, and this time praised the performance of the young actor. Later, he repeatedly appeared in RSC productions, including Romeo and Juliet in 2000, where he played the main role. For a long time, it was the theater that was his mainstay, since work in the cinema wasn't as much as he would like. But David was already incredibly happy. The opportunity to play on the stage of a famous theater was more than he could ever wish for. In addition to collaborating with the RSC, David proved himself well on the stage of the National Theater in the play What the Butler Saw in 1995. When, many years later, during one of the awards seasons, he was bypassed by the awards, David was asked if the lack of awards annoyed him. He replied, I remember filming adverts for early on-demand service Home Choice in 2000, shouting in a beret like Citizen Smith in a tank on Leamington Spa High Street. Then I do Romeo and Juliet at the RSC in the evenings. I'm incredibly fortunate to be working consistently, so it would be really churlish to get worked up about the rest of it. Work was gradually getting better. For the first time, he appeared in a big movie, playing a drunken student in the drama Jude in 1996, where Kate Winslet and another future Doctor Who, Christopher Eccleston, had the main roles. The first major role went to David in the romantic drama L.A. Without a Map in 1998, where he played a role of a modest Scot who went to Los Angeles for his beloved. Then there were a few more minor roles, including in the drama Bright Young Things in 2003, directed by Stephen Fry. Interestingly, one of the main roles there was played by his future partner in Good Omens and friend Michael Sheen. Work in the theater also bore fruit, and in 2003, the actor was nominated for the prestigious Laurence Olivier Theatre Award for his role in the play Lobby Hero. During one of the performances, he was noticed by the writer Peter Bowker, who was preparing the script for the detective drama Blackpool for BBC One. There was something about David that reminded him of a young Peter Capaldi, which is ironic because both subsequently played, well, you know who. With David, it's his intelligence that makes him sexy. Obviously, he's a good-looking boy and in good shape, but fundamentally, it's his intelligence. He's curious and full of ideas. He is also rock-solid labor, which is always a plus. So, David got the role of Detective Inspector Peter Carlyle in a bold series about a mysterious murder in a casino. It would seem, what could be special about it, it was an ordinary detective. But this is only at first glance. It's unlikely that you'll find musical numbers in many detectives. You keep lying when you ought to be truthing. Of course, it wasn't easy for Tennant to combine singing and dancing with acting, but it was something new for him, and it was really fun. The show turned out to be quite a success, and even received a nomination for the Golden Globe Award, and David was nicknamed the new Scottish star. Naturally, directors and screenwriters began to pay more attention to him. It was not yet a moment of phenomenal success and fame, but it had to wait just a little bit. The turning point for the actor was 2005, when three important projects were released that determined his future career. Let's start with Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. 
where Tennant got thanks to the fact that he was able to impress the filmmakers with his theatrical works. In the franchise about the boy who survived, he played the role of a semi-insane follower of the Dark Lord, Barty Crouch Jr. Clearly, being a part of it was significant because they were such enormous movies and are movies that I'm sure will live down the years. I feel a bit of a fraud because my entire contribution was 12 days of filming. It wasn't much, so I feel a little bit like I can't really take much credit for any success that those movies had, but it's nice to have been a part of it, however small. The role was small, but it was still remembered by the audience. Of course, try to forget that predatory look and compulsive lip-licking in the spirit of the Joker. It's even harder to forget his role as the audacious seducer Casanova from the BBC3 miniseries of the same name. And you, sir, just consider, you love your wife. I love your wife. Aren't we both on the same side? The appearance of David as a contender for the role was a salvation for the creators of the series because they could not find a suitable actor in any way. It was very difficult to cast it because it was sexy and sexual, but we had written the role wiser than it might have been, recalled Russell T. Davies, the project's screenwriter. We auditioned every single actor in the world and it just wasn't working. I put in his VHS tape and went to the kitchen to make tea and remember hearing his voice saying my dialogue exactly as I wanted it. The BBC management was clearly not thrilled that the main role would be played by an unknown actor, but they soon realized that he was special and that it would be a big mistake not to give him this job. Casanova, performed by David, turned out to be expressive, passionate, disarmingly charming, and at the same time, surprisingly human. All because Russell T. Davies sought to distance the hero from the usual image of a heartless womanizer, and David diligently fulfilled this task. According to the actor himself, his hero was, quote, a modern man, a sort of metrosexual. He was very open, wide-eyed, a puppy dog bouncing through life, eating life up, but not doing it at the expense of anyone else. If you're wondering what his parents thought about such a provocative role, then they were both fine. They have seen him in stranger and more explicit roles. And the actor recalled Casanova's intimate scenes with a laugh. It was a romp, Tennant said. There's not a lot of gratuitous nudity, but there's a lot of skirts, bustiers, and corsets. And that's just me. Despite the fact that he played the role of a female seducer, David himself is always modest and does not consider himself a playboy. And he protests very loudly when interviewers call him sexy. You know, my bedpost really has very few notches compared with other actors of my, erm, um, pedigree. He always preferred monogamy and did not date several girls at the same time. The actor's too tormented by guilt to even try to avoid punishment for something like this. He's sure that it's all about Presbyterian education, which covers all spheres of life. It's all connected, the actor says. That sense that you're not worthy and therefore you have to prove your worth and you don't get above your station. Critics appreciated his performance in the series, but more importantly, Russell T. Davies liked him, who at that time was also the showrunner of Doctor Who. When it became clear that the lead actor Christopher Eccleston would leave the post of the Ninth Doctor earlier than planned, the question arose about who could replace him, and Russell thought of Tennant. He knew that the actor was a fan of the Doctor and had already managed to play several minor roles in the Big Finish audio plays based on the 1963 version of Doctor Who. Actually, David was not just one of the contenders, he became the only possible option for Davies. He was funny, not in a slapstick way, and that's one of the keys to the character. The screenwriter recalls, David's not your classical screen god, instead he's interesting and intelligent, with a lightness to his acting that not many straight actors have, and, as with Casanova, he does certainly seem to have an effect on all the women around him. So, Casanova ended up being my kind of audition for Doctor Who, although I was completely unaware of it at the time, because I didn't realize they were looking for anyone. Davies says it wasn't Tennant's performance as Casanova that persuaded him to cast him as Doctor Who. More that, having worked with him, he knew here was somebody he could write anything for. Tennant was invited to Davies' house, ostensibly, to be shown rough cuts of the first series of Doctor Who. What was his surprise when Davies and Julie Gardner, the executive producer of the series, asked if he wanted to play the role of a doctor. It was a joyous moment when I asked him. He took a deep breath and burst out laughing. The first thing he said was, I want a coat down to here, and pointed to his ankle. And David got it. For the first time, the Tenth Doctor briefly appeared in the series Parting of the Ways after the regeneration scene. There was also a seven-minute special shown as part of the charity event Children in Need. 
Despite the fact that being Doctor Who is the dream of millions of actors, and his own, it took David two weeks to make a decision. The fact is that the series has just been restarted after a long pause, and the lead actor Christopher Eccleston was able to retire. Therefore, Tennant was afraid that his time as a Doctor might be even shorter. What if I film a little bit for the end of episode 13, the show doesn't ever go again, and I'm the person that played the Doctor for 35 seconds? <laughs> But one morning he woke up and thought, how could you sit at home and watch someone else do this part? You've got to do it. On the day he was chosen for the role of the Doctor, David Tennant joked that the first line of his obituary was written. The newcomer was supported by his predecessors. The actor received good luck cards from Tom Baker and Peter Davidson. It was a huge honor for Tennant, who grew up on their acting works. The dream of a three-year-old boy has come true. It's so utterly unpredictable the way things worked out. It's so fantastically unlikely. The odds are so ludicrously small that if I think about it too much, it makes me feel vertiginous. The costume is one of the most important elements of the Doctor's image. Each of David's predecessors had a memorable appearance that reflected his character, and the Tenth Doctor needed it too. The actor had his own ideas about what his character should look like. It would be wrong to go back to the frock coats and Victoriana of the classic series. Tennant recalled, Chris had done something almost aggressively modern, which I think worked brilliantly to bring the show back. It still had to be something of now, but different from the leather jacket and jeans, because that had been done. In the end, they agreed on a slim fit suit in brown shades. Interestingly, the fabric for the jacket was taken from ready made gap trousers. During the development of the image, costume designer Louise Page bought these trousers just to see if David would like their shape, but when he put them on, he asked, Why can't we make the whole suit out of this? There were no ready-made jackets for them, and Louise could not find a similar fabric anywhere. Therefore, she bought as many trousers as possible and made jackets out of them. The main thing was for David to be happy, because it had to be a costume that he was going to stay in night and day, Russell T. Davies recalled. We varied it. Sometimes we'd put him in a tuxedo. Sometimes we'd put him in a blue version of that suit, but really, it was what he wanted. Obviously, we had to like it, too. If he'd said he wanted to do the whole thing in a onesie, we might have had some notes. But for a handsome man to be in a tight suit looking so good, there was no question that that costume worked. We loved it. The idea to put the 10th Doctor in sneakers belonged to David. He asked to be allowed to wear his own pair of worn cream Converse high tops. He drew inspiration from the image of Jamie Oliver, previously seen on TV, who wore a suit with trainers. Tennant really liked the idea of going for something that could be quite authoritative and then messing it up. So the Doctor's suit was always wrinkled and slightly too tight. So he wore his own shoes in The Christmas Invasion, after which the costumers bought him a new pair. The finished image turned out to be a little sloppy, boyish, but at the same time, attractive and with a gloss. David nicknamed him Geek Chic. The actor said that it was not far from what he usually wore in those days, and he added, So I now have to be careful. If people see me out and about looking too much like Doctor Who, that would be pretty naff. It was decided that Tennant would not use his native Scottish accent for the role, but instead use estuary English. But contrary to the yellow headlines of tabloids, the actor was not upset because it was part of his job. Playing a cult role that a dozen other actors have already tried on was not the same as starting from scratch. You're standing on a solid foundation laid long before you. Nevertheless, David did not seek advice from Christopher Eccleston and did not set himself the task of doing certain things the way his predecessors did. Unlike other enduring characters such as Sherlock Holmes or Tarzan, being the Doctor allows you a certain freedom that is both very demanding and very thrilling, he said. It allows you to make the character using elements of yourself. However, there is a danger of making such open-ended characters too quirky, he added. You can drop yourself in it by saying, my Doctor must always hop on a Tuesday, so you end up with this rather ugly mannerism for no good reason. With a part like the Doctor, it's very tempting to think, I've got to make it mine by doing X, Y, Z. Tom Baker had a long scarf, and Peter Davidson wore a cricket jumper, and so on. I think if you're trying to be too self-consciously clever, it trips up somehow. So I thought, um, I'll see what Russell writes, and go from there. The main thing that worried Tennant was the level of responsibility and the need to meet the expectations of the audience, especially the old fans of the show. The fact that everyone was so fascinated by the series made it the most wonderful job in the world, but also the most terrifying. My problem is that I have to live up to that and not be the reason that this year it falls to bits. So it's not so much a leap of faith for me as a leap of hope. I've got much further to fall now that the show is such a big hit. It is intimidating. You think, what if I'm the George Lazenby of this? But then you think, I can't not take it on. 
The first working day at the set was not easy. Although the team welcomed him cordially, David was terribly exhausted by the evening. It was so kind of overexciting and I'm very overstimulated. I'm like a sort of five-year-old who's had too much, too many E-numbers. Um, and now I'm, I'm on the come down. Um, I'm aching and I'm... Uh, the scenes went okay. I mean, I'd like to do them again. The actor recalled walking home in a semi-fainting state due to the amount of nervous energy accumulated a few months before the start of filming. But it was worth it. On the evening of December 25, 2005, almost 10 million Britons sat down to watch the first ever one-hour special Christmas episode of Doctor Who, The Christmas Invasion. It was in it that the audience was able to fully get acquainted with the new inhabitant of the TARDIS. Here we are then. London! Earth! The solar system, isn't it? Thus, the era of the Tenth Doctor began. Interestingly, it was this series that started the tradition of Doctor Who Christmas specials. In the first incarnation of the series, there were none, except for one episode that was released on Christmas Day and where the Doctor actually turned to the camera and said, Merry Christmas to everyone. In the version with Christopher Eccleston, there was also a suitable episode in Spirit with Dickens and Snow, but it was not broadcast on Christmas Day. You need to understand that the BBC has found a great time for this series, when a huge number of people were supposed to gather at the TV screens. According to Russell T. Davies, it was like being given the greatest gift in British television you could possibly ask for. The Christmas episode could attract not only old fans, but also a huge new audience. The stakes were high, an epic adventure was needed, and that's why the episode was a great way to present the new Doctor to the audience. Russell T. Davies admitted that he went to some trick planning the script. Tennant doesn't just lie unconscious for most of the first half of the series regenerating. The showrunner was afraid that if he demonstrated everything the Doctor was capable of at the very beginning, people would just leave for Christmas dinner. Therefore, the hero broke into the game only in the last 20 minutes. And he was magnificent. He's dazzling verbally. He's dazzling physically. He has a sword fight. He wins the sword fight. He brings down a prime minister with six words. He's funny. He's dramatic. He's everything. He's absolutely everything in 20 minutes flat. It's like the finest audition piece in the world. Not for David, he's already got the part, but it's like he's auditioning for the great British public to say, come and like me. And I think it did. I think it worked. The showrunner did not lose. The episode became extremely positive, receiving excellent ratings, and David woke up a celebrity. Both the audience and critics warmly welcomed the new Doctor. In 2006, readers of Doctor Who magazine voted Tenet Best Doctor over perennial favorite Tom Baker. In 2007, a Radio Times survey named him the coolest man on TV. The National Television Awards named him most popular actor of 2006, 2007, 2008, and 2010. But fame has two sides, and David got to know the darker one very quickly. To be at the center of the show is wonderful and humbling, but also a bit overwhelming and terrifying. It doesn't come without some difficulties, such as the immediate loss of anonymity. It takes a bit of getting used to, if that's not been your life up to that point. He thought that he had prepared himself for the fact that he would suddenly fall under the lenses of thousands of cameras, becoming the object of interest of millions. But according to him, the way you imagine it's going to be is not the way it is at all. It's much more exposing, and the imaginative leap you've had that it will give you status or make you invulnerable is all wrong. It makes you very vulnerable and very raw. Once, for example, David was woken up at 7 a.m. by a tabloid journalist who rang his doorbell and threatened to publish an article about some Natasha from Shoreditch, the brothel, women of the oldest profession in banned substances. However, he did not have photos with confirmation. One wonders why. According to a 2008 Cosmopolitan poll, Tennant was voted the 16th sexiest man in the world. It was not surprising that the paparazzi took every opportunity to come up with a sensation. If you look at the tabloid articles for all the years that he was a doctor, you can assume that the actor dated all the women on the set of Doctor Who. Which, of course, was false. David, at least, denied it. If we talk about the great importance of the doctor's partners in David's life, it's about their support and friendly advice. It was Billy Piper who played the role of Doctor's companion, Rose Tyler, who helped him cope with sudden fame. She'd lived in a glare of publicity since she was 14, so she was a great guide for how to live life under that kind of scrutiny. According to David, thanks to her, he survived it much better than he might have. I owe a degree of sanity to Billy. Little has changed in his lifestyle. Well, except for the need to run from the paparazzi and dodge questions about his personal life for an interview. 
In 2007, he continued to drive his modest old Skoda. People are amazed that I've got a Skoda. Next time, I'll want something with ethics that I'm more comfortable with, you know? The eco thing. I'm waiting for someone to bring out something that will run on, I don't know, cornflakes. You know how if you're in a room where someone famous walks in, you sense the room bristle slightly? You sense everyone either eyeballing them or pretending not to, and you know that they know, but you imagine that affords the famous person a self-confidence and power. But actually, it does completely the opposite. You step into that room and you shrink, and you feel self-conscious, and you feel scared. It's a very, very hard thing to cope with becoming that famous very quickly, Russell T. Davies said. To deal with such heat of publicity, you need to have your wits about you and look after yourself. He did that from the start. The screenwriter believed that Tennant remained down to earth because he was just a well-mannered person from a good family. Speaking of parents, they were able to visit their son on the set while working on his first season and even participated in reading the script. A couple of actors could not come, so the McDonald couple was happy to read the lines instead of them. Russell T. Davies has done a tremendous job trying to interest a new generation of viewers, but in search of new interesting stories, he did not forget about the old characters from the classic series. For example, one of the most intense episodes with the Tenth Doctor was the one where he met his old enemy, the Master. Initially, the screenwriter wanted the characters to switch bodies. Comedies with such a plot twist can often be found in movies, but then Davies changed his mind, because he felt that the idea was too similar to an early episode where the Tenth Doctor and Rose switched bodies with another character, Cassandra. Working on Doctor Who was exhausting, but nevertheless amazing. David, claiming to be personally interested in the character, gave 200%. I'm aware that I am in something that I will be proud of for the rest of my life. The actor managed to find the key to his character, make it unique, and at the same time preserve the spirit of Doctor Who. Billy Piper said in an interview of those years, Chris would go away in between breaks and save his energy for the performance, whereas with David, we'll kind of chat, we'll have a laugh, but then as soon as he needs to focus, he'll find his own way of doing that. David dances with it more. He's a bit more like a, I don't know, a baby deer. He's my little Bambi. It was a fan who took up the role with enthusiasm and love. As one interviewer well noted, this is a man who can talk about the gravitic anomalizer without a protective layer of irony. This makes Tennant the perfect actor for the role of the Doctor. According to the memoirs of colleagues, he's a walking encyclopedia of the universe of the series. Catherine Tate, who played the role of another companion, spoke about her partner's extensive knowledge as follows. Because he does remember all these things, and he would really revel when we'd get a script where, say, the Santarans were back, or there was some alien who was last seen in 1972. I think there's never a moment where he's not relishing it. And even now, nearly four years down the line, he relishes it, and attacks it, and never tires of it. And so that makes everybody raise their game. Many actors keep small, or perhaps not so small ones, souvenirs from film sets as a keepsake. Some take them, even despite the prohibitions. David didn't have to steal. The team presented him with a small box of all sorts of things from Doctor Who, including a sonic screwdriver, a stethoscope, and a key to the TARDIS. But there was another important gift from the Doctor Who universe to David Tennant, and this, of course, is a meeting with his future wife, Georgia Moffat, in 2008. Here, we can say the stars align nicely. Georgia is the daughter of actor Peter Davidson, who played the fifth Doctor. At the same time, she played the daughter of the tenth Doctor in the series. Dear heart. Exactly. What's going on? Does that mean she's a... What do you call a female Time Lord? What's a Time Lord? It's who I am. It's where I'm from. Crazy, isn't it? Georgia recalled their collaboration as follows. It was winter when we filmed in Cardiff, and I was wearing little, so you can imagine how cold that was. David kindly lent me his coat between takes. I put it on and ripped the back of it. He's a good six foot something, and he's never ripped it. I'm 5'2", put it on, and I destroyed it. David is famous for being secretive when it comes to romantic relationships. Little is known about his previous romances. Previously, he could be seen with actresses Sophia Miles and Anne-Marie Duff. The actor is sure that relationships are hard enough with the people you're having them with, let alone talking about them in public. So, we know about how their first dates with Georgia went, thanks to Peter Davidson. They met there, and she said, oh, I said, how is David Tennant? She said, oh, he's very nice. He said, but he wants to take me out to the theatre because he doesn't think I, I know enough about Shakespeare. <laughs> and I thought, hello. <laughs> 
So uh, anyway, he he he, uh, he took her out to the theatre to see a Shakespeare production, and then uh, I said, how, how was it? And she said, Oh no, it's fine. And he just took me out, and you know, he, he I just didn't really like the play, but uh, he said so he wants to take me out to another one. <laughs> so anyway, this went on. I said, I said, said to her, well, I think it's because he likes you. And she said, oh, no, 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 it's not that. No, he just, he's just really annoyed that I don't appreciate Shakespeare. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I said, no, to me, trust me, if he's inviting you out to Shakespeare, look in the mirror. It's because he likes you. Uh, uh, anyway, she refused to accept that this was a possibility until she rang me up about, about this girl for about three or four months. She rang me up uh, one morning and she, I said, oh, no, no. she said, I think he likes me. <laughs> Only in 2020, in one of the joint podcasts, the couple told a little bit how their feelings originated. David admitted that he had doubts about the appropriateness of such a relationship since he was 14 years older. In addition, he was slightly frightened by the overwhelming number of doctors and daughters in this potential romance. Because Doctor Who had run through my life like a stick of rock, to end up marrying the daughter of one of the doctors, it all felt a bit stupid. So there were a lot of things against it. Therefore, at first, Georgia was the main driving force. Had I not worked quite so hard, it might not have happened. Addressing her husband during the podcast, she added, You couldn't quite believe that's why I was messaging you 400 times a day? You thought maybe I was lonely and wanted to chat? I very much fell into stalker category. Thank goodness I did, though. I just made a decision, I thought. This is going to be good. Let's do this. I'll just persevere until he gives in. And he, of course, gave up. Tennant is convinced that he was lucky to meet Georgia. There's a great Tim Minchin song. If I didn't have you, someone else would probably do it, he said, but I certainly feel like I lucked out. You reach a point in your life when you're looking for someone and it's sort of a chance which version of that perfect partner ambles along. I just have to say I love the doctor's daughter. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> He was the 10th doctor for five years. During this time, armed with a stethoscope and a sonic screwdriver, he saved the planet Earth countless times, and once, the Titanic. He taught us to be human, and of course, ran a lot in pajamas with a tie knotted around his head, wearing a motorcycle helmet and 3D glasses. It was time to say goodbye. I want to go while I still love it, Tennant explained. I've had such a good time, and I want to keep it special. During the filming of the last scene, before regeneration, David recorded four takes, and each of them was more dramatic than the previous one. But then, on reflection, the actor decided that the darkest version with tears does not quite match the character of the hero, and chose a more restrained version. I'm really not going to say this, I'm getting sad, but I don't want to get sad. Um, because I'm very happy to... Oh, shut up, stop. <laughs> um, there's... I'm very proud of this and working with all you people. Oh, this is ridiculous. Stop it. Um, ah! I'm very proud of everything we've done and um, thank you all very, very much. Although the filming of Doctor Who took nine months a year, Tennant somehow found time for other projects. There's the actor's fear of the dead phone, but part of it is the Scottish Presbyterian work ethic. He explained his frenzied schedule. I'm also doing it because it's fun, though. It's a very exciting time doing some unique things that won't be there forever. I know that. His work capacity and professionalism helped him not to get stuck forever in the image of a doctor. Yes, perhaps for many it will be his main role. Nevertheless, it is unlikely that he will dare to call Tennant an actor of one role. Peter Bowker, with whom Tennant worked with on Blackpool, believed that one of the Tennant's talents is to be ugly and handsome in the same scene. David can go from geeky copper to handsome lover in just one moment, and I think he knows when he's doing it. That's the sign of a great actor. He's very good at capturing those moments when you find yourself surprisingly drawn to someone emotionally. His acting range can really cover any, or almost any, role. For example, Tennant played the role of a psychopath who tried to take revenge on an ex-girlfriend by dating her sister in the 2006 drama Secret Smile. In 2007, he had the role of a devout Christian who taught driving lessons in the comedy drama Learners. And he was the villain, a member of the secret masculinist brotherhood in the 2009 adventure family film St. Trinian's II, The Legend of Fritton's Gold. One of his most powerful films of those years was the drama Recovery. Tennant got the role of a man who got serious brain damage as a result of an accident. Alan, a successful family man and builder, woke up after the accident changed. 
He had problems with loss of restraint. Anger. The plot focused on the relationship of the main character with his wife, Trisha, who no longer recognized the man who had lived side by side with her for 20 years. She tried her best to help him return to normal life. Tennant visited patients with the same diagnosis, their guardians, nurses, and medical experts for several weeks to study his character. Subsequently, he even became a patron of the brain injury charity Headway Essex, which took an active part in the work on the film. Tennant did not forget about the theater. In 2005, he took part in the staging of Look Back in Anger, and in 2008, the actor returned to the Royal Shakespeare Company to play the role that most actors dream of. Hamlet it was interesting not only the production itself, which rethought the classics, focusing on the elements of the thriller, but also the circumstances through which Tennant got his role. In 2006, he participated in the filming of the program Who Do You Think You Are?, in which famous people conduct research on their ancestry. David visited the ancient church on the island of Mull, where his ancestor was baptized. At that moment, excavations were being carried out on the territory, and the actor came across several skulls laid out on the ground. Almost without thinking, Tennant took one of them to examine, but then suddenly realized that this was probably not the right thing to do, and timidly returned the skull pack. When the episode with Tennant was released, it was seen by Greg Duran, chief associate director of the Royal Shakespeare Company. He immediately wrote to the actor, I've just seen your audition for Hamlet. Since David was still filming in Doctor Who in 2008, the production caused a huge stir. On the day of the start of ticket sales, hundreds of people lined up, and some even spent the night in tents near the theater in London's West End. Within three hours of the tickets going on sale, all 6,000 of them were sold out. Hamlet is a very popular play, an RSC spokesperson said at the time. It's the most famous, but obviously there's the factor that David Tennant is in it, and the good news is that he's bringing a lot of younger audiences to Shakespeare. Despite the wide publicity, RSC managed to hide one intriguing fact about the production until the premiere, and this was a real skull that the troupe used in every performance. It belonged to Andrzej Tchaikovsky, a Polish composer who was a regular at Stratford and bequeathed his skull to the RSC. According to Tenet, working on the play itself felt like climbing a mountain. However, he expected this. From the very beginning, the actor decided to treat Hamlet the same way as any other role and see what happens. What he did not expect was an increase in tension and stress due to increased interest in his person. This role always attracts a lot of attention, as a kind of aptitude test for any self-respecting actor. But at that time, Tennant was at the peak of fame, everyone's favorite in addition. Therefore, the level of expectations was off the scale. Will the restless Time Lord be able to successfully regenerate into the Prince of Denmark, obsessed with the search for truth? Tennant tried desperately to concentrate on his work while telling himself that this was just a play and there was no need to worry about historical consequences. And then on the first night, the BBC News 24 van rolled up outside and I thought, now really, come on, let's all calm down, I'm scared enough. And suddenly you're faced with the thought that if this doesn't work, it's going to be reported around the world that I've failed. On the first preview night, he remembers thinking, you must never do a play again, this is horrible. Judging by the mostly positive reviews, we can say that the hype caused by the performance was justified. Most critics agreed that Tennant was one of the most memorable and outstanding performers of this role. This is a hamlet of quicksilver intelligence, mimetic vigor, and wild humor. The Guardian columnist wrote in a four-star review, I've seen bolder hamlets and more moving hamlets, but few who kept me so riveted throughout. The Times journalist admitted, when the Royal Mail paid tribute to the 50th anniversary of the RSC in 2011 with a series of stamps depicting some RSC productions, Tennant appeared as Hamlet on one of them. Remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain, oh, vengeance! Why, what an ass am I? While Tennant was wondering to be or not to be on stage, new films with his participation were released on the screens. Among the most notable was Einstein and Eddington of 2008. The historical drama tells about the dangerous relationship between the British scientist Arthur Eddington, played by David, and the German physicist Albert Einstein, played by Andy Serkis. The film tells how their correspondence during the First World War put these two scientists at great risk. They exchanged truly revolutionary ideas forever changing the course of modern science. David claims that he doesn't have a preferred genre. I would feel shortchanged if I stopped one type, he says. Therefore, in his filmography, you can find family dramas, such as the miniseries Single Father, and historical dramas like Glorious 39, in which he had a minor role, and romantic comedies, such as, for example, The Decoy Bride of 2011. But surprisingly, 
all of them are either filmed for television or author's projects with a not very high budget. His first big movie in Hollywood was the comedy horror Fright Night, released in 2011. This is a modern reinterpretation of the 1985 film of the same name. It tells the story of a vampire hunter who tries to find out if a local resident is actually a vampire responsible for a series of mysterious deaths. The film as a whole received good reviews, although it was barely able to pay off production costs at the box office. Tenet was nominated for a Fright Meter Award for a supporting role as a vampire expert. Yes, and there is one. But despite that partial success, David did not think that this was a new step in his career. The actor just likes diversity the opportunity to work for television, for big screens, and in the theater. Therefore, he would be very upset if he was deprived of any of these three options. I'd just like to join the jobs up and hope they will be as varied and interesting as possible. So if I can do a film with DreamWorks, then come back and do a little British film, then do something in the West End, then do something for the BBC, that's great. Can we please get back to Shakespeare? Whatever you say, David. In 2011, the actor reunited with Catherine Tate to play in Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. He got the main role of Benedict, a slightly childish and witty soldier who leads the so-called Merry War with Lady Beatrice. The events of the play have been moved to the present, dressing the characters from puffy skirts and pantaloons into short shorts and cocktail dresses, and replacing the carriage with a miniature touring car. By the way, the idea in one of the scenes to put a Superman t-shirt on Benedict belonged to Tennant. In general, critics have left positive reviews. Tennant has a wonderful way of demystifying Shakespearean verse without patronizing it, mining every word for maximum humor or pathos. That was the verdict of the Guardian review. And the same Guardian wrote that the pairing of David Tennant as Benedict with Catherine Tate as Beatrice is a marriage that, if not made in heaven, is certainly cemented by television and pays off superbly. And it's hard not to agree. Is it possible disdain should die when she has such meat food to feed it as Signor Benedict? <laughs> courtesy itself must convert to disdain if you come in her presence. Then is courtesy a turncoat? But it is certain I am loved of all ladies, mm -hmm. only you excepted. Well, what could be better, Tennant said, acting in a great play to a sold-out audience with one of your best mates. He and Catherine Tate really have a very powerful chemistry, and it doesn't matter if it's Shakespeare, Doctor Who, or a charity video. I don't know what you're talking about. You look like Doctor Who, though. I'm not Doctor Who, I'm your English teacher. I don't think you are, though. Lauren. I think you're a 945-year-old Time Lord. Listen. <laughs> Did you just pitch up from Mars? Don't be ridiculous. You know your house, right? What? You know your house? Yeah. Is it bigger on the inside? Be quiet. 2011 was also notable for the changes in his personal life. In March of this year, Georgia gave birth to a baby girl who was named Olivia. This made David the father of two children, since around the same time he adopted Ty, Georgia's son from a previous relationship. I watched him on TV as the hero, and it was crazy how much your life can change. Ty would remember years later. I love David Tennant because he runs very fast. So is he your favorite doctor then? Yes. Who's your second favorite? Um, Tom Baker. Who's your third favourite? My third... I don't have a third favourite. What? Granddad will be really happy to know that. In December of the same year, the couple got married. Georgia decided to take the surname of her husband, who almost at the same time also became tenant officially, according to all documents. David had to give up the surname McDonald because of a problem with the Screen Actors Guild of the USA, which already had another David Tennant. Faced with the prospect of working in different countries under two different names, he had to officially rename himself. Only after that, the guild left him in peace. Uh, and it was just at the time that I was adopting my son, and we were about to have my daughter, and we were about to get married, all at the same time. <laughs> so we all changed our name all at once. 2012 was remembered mainly for two things, the premiere of the critically acclaimed Christmas comedy Nativity 2, Danger in the Manger, and the fact that readers of British GQ named Tennant the third best-dressed man, behind Tom Hiddleston and Robert Pattinson. The actor modestly evaluates his abilities in the field of fashion, saying that he does that typical male thing of finding one thing and doing it to death. Tennant insists that becoming a recognizable face has not changed his style, but has made him more aware that he shouldn't wear something more than once because people comment on it. Yeah. Oh, that's so embarrassing. I'm wearing the same suit. Come on. And <laughs> tie. <laughs> 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 
that doesn't make me look very windswept and celebrity-tastic. <laughs> Although David resigned as a doctor, he continues to voice audio performances about this universe to this day. And in 2013, the actor briefly returned to the screens for a special episode, The Day of the Doctor, dedicated to the 50th anniversary of the series. It was a joy not only to see Tennant again in the company of Billy Piper, but also to observe his interaction with the 11th Doctor, Matt Smith. Compensating? For what? Regeneration, it's a lottery. Oh, he's cool. Isn't he cool? I'm the Doctor and I'm all cool. Oops, I'm wearing sand shoes. What are you doing here? I'm busy. 2013 was generally rich in premieres. For example, the thriller The Escape Artist received good reviews. David played the main role of a talented lawyer who won cases no matter what. But his lack of a moral dilemma about the acquittal of guilty defendants one day took a bad turn. Tennant was very interested in the role. If you're privileged enough to be reading a number of scripts, the ones that you don't want anyone else to have are quite easy to recognize, and this was one of those. The actor said, this is because he believed that this was not an ordinary judicial thriller, but something more layered. Screenwriter David Wollstonecroft, who created the series, was pleased with the actor's work. There are very few actors who can be so chameleon-like and inhabit roles in the way he does. He said, he pulls off this phenomenal depth of emotional range and brings a laser-like precision in the way that he approaches a role. He's very well prepared and raises everyone's game. I would cast him in everything. There were also Spies of Warsaw about a French intelligent agent involved in the vicissitudes of the beginning of World War II and The Politician's Husband, which makes up something like a diptych along with the 1995 television drama The Politician's Wife. In addition, David returned to the RSC to successfully play the lead role in the Shakespearean play Richard II. But perhaps David's most notable project in 2013 was the detective drama Broadchurch. According to the plot, in a small town where everyone knew each other, a mysterious murder of a boy took place. Local Sergeant Ellie Miller, played by Olivia Coleman, and newly arrived Detective Inspector Alec Hardy, played by Tennant, take over the case. The series, which subsequently had two more seasons, turned out to be dark, dramatic, and never let go of the viewer's attention for a second. The creator of Broadchurch, Chris Chibnall, began working on the script back in 2002, but it took him 10 years to get the show on the air. One of the elements of the series for which he was so praised by both critics and viewers, in addition to the fascinating detective component, were well-developed characters. Watching their development was no less interesting than watching the solving case. And of course, at the center of all this was the harsh, unfriendly detective Alec Hardy, who was fighting his own demons in parallel with the investigation. Tennant got the role without an audition. Chris Chibnall said in an interview, Whenever I talk to David about a part, he always wants to be pushed. He wants to do something different. His character in Broadchurch is pretty much the polar opposite of the Doctor, but he does it in very subtle ways. It was like he had slowed down his metabolism. He walks slower. He even blinks slower deliberately calibrating his performance in ways that you wouldn't really even notice. The secrecy around the name of the real culprit was so strong that most of the actors did not know who the killer was before filming began, and for the first time after that. Everyone played as if they could hide a terrible secret. They even placed bets on who they thought was the killer. All scripts were named to identify the owner if someone forgot their copy on set, and the digital versions were password protected. But even with such strict control, an oversight was made. One of the crew members went abroad during filming, and his laptop was stolen, of course. Fortunately, there was no leak. The series received good reviews and many awards, including seven BAFTA nominations, three of which it won. Ironically, the show lost the BAFTA audience award to the Doctor Who special episode, The Day of the Doctor. The series became so successful that it soon received an American remake called Grace Point, in which Tennant again played the role of a sullen detective. In the US, he will play the same role but reimagined, Chibnall explained. There's no sense of entitlement. David has a real work ethic. He has empathy with lots of people and can bring humanity to the most complex, dark characters, but can also find good in people without it seeming weak or uninteresting. And then it goes off in different directions and... It, it, it might have a few surprises that you're... Oh, I see. Another pleasant event that year was the birth of David's third child, who was named Wilfred. Our kids are lovely, and I think that being a dad is one of the most extraordinary and life-affirming things that can ever happen to you, as well as being something you have to keep working at if you're going to be any good at it. After that, he became a father twice more. Doris was born in 2015, and Bertie was born in 2019. The next major project of the actor was the series Marvel's Jessica Jones, the first season of which was released in 2015. There, Tennant got the role of the villain Kilgrave, who had the ability to manipulate anyone with the power of suggestion. 
He was obsessed with Jessica Jones, whom he has forced to do terrible things in the past. One of Marvel's most elaborate and creepy villains has deservedly received the right actor to embody him on screen. You definitely wouldn't want to meet him in real life. I never know if someone is doing what they want or what I tell them to. Oh, poor you. You have no idea, do you? I have to painstakingly choose every word I say. I once told a man to go screw himself. Can you even imagine? Tennant was completely immersed in the character. You see the eyes of a mad person who has no idea about morality instead of the brilliant loving eyes of Romeo. And instead of the doctor's sincere smile, there's a cynical grin. Kilgrave evokes strange, uncomfortable emotions. On the one hand, you despise him and what he does to others. On the other hand, you can't take your eyes off the screen, admiring Tennant's charisma. A completely different impression is made by the actor himself, about whom colleagues always speak in a positive way. The incomparable David Tennant. He is a total pro. He's a joy to be around. He's a very kind person, a very supportive scene partner. One of the best scene partners I've ever had in my whole career, and I've had a few great ones. David Tennant blew my mind day in and day out with not only his acting ability, but his professionalism and his general attitude. Just like a good guy. Such a great person. This role earned him a Saturn Award nomination. Tennant has once again proved that he is very good at villains and anti-heroes. By the way, he auditioned for the role of Hannibal Lecter in the NBC series Hannibal. And although Mads Mikkelsen won in the end, the creator of the show, Brian Fuller, calls himself a big Tennant fan. He tried to bring an actor into the series as a minor character, but it didn't work out. He's such a spectacular actor, Fuller said. He brings such an effervescence to every performance. I would love to have David on the show, or just write for David. I would kill and eat somebody to work with David. He's my favorite doctor. In 2015, Tennant found time to voice the Labor Party general election broadcast. He is a longtime and ardent supporter of leftist views. Back in 2005, he participated in the party political broadcast on behalf of the Labor Party. For a long time, the actor has been neutral on the issue of Scottish independence. Tennant believed that it was not for him to decide since he had not lived in his homeland for a long time. But in 2017, after Brexit, which he called depressing, he said that if the Scots hold a referendum again, they should separate from the UK. Politically, I think we're in for quite a dark time. I'm very aware that Scotland is where I'm from, he says. I had no relationship with Scotland when I lived there. I had no interest in nationalism, no interest in Scotland's nationhood or legacy or any of that stuff until I moved down to London, which is a terribly crass, idiotic thing to say, but it's true. I like the sense of being something different down here, though. But despite the fact that he does not hide his views, Tennant believes that they should not influence the opinions of other people. You have to be careful about presuming that because you're on telly, your opinion counts. He is convinced. I'm not an expert, so I'm not going to profligate about my opinions. Let's get back to the career. Tennant is unchanged in his love of diversity, so in 2017, several various projects were released. The first was Mad to be Normal. It was a low-budget biographical drama about the infamous psychiatrist Artie Lang. Fascinating, hugely problematic character, as Tennant himself described it. There was also a romantic comedy, You, Me, and Him, about a lesbian couple's relationship with their slightly slutty neighbor. One of the producers of this film was Georgia Tennant. I love working with my wife. She was the boss on the set of You, Me, and Him, and I think she's my boss anyway, so it wasn't noticeably different from everyday life. We complement each other well. It was a gamble because the older I get, the more cynical I become. The actor continued to reveal the theme of promiscuity in the production of Don Juan in Soho, for which he was awarded at the 18th annual What's On Stage Awards, won Brian Cranston and Andrew Scott. As someone who grew up as a Scottish Presbyterian where guilt is one's engine in life, there's something really enjoyable about playing such an inhuman character. The actor admitted, It's quite titillating, as long as you leave it behind in the dressing room every night. And that year, he voiced Scrooge McDuck in the reboot of the famous Disney animated series DuckTales. That's the variety. Danger, watch behind you. There's a stranger out to find you. Woo. What to do? Just grab on to some DuckTales. Woo! In general, the actor often participates in the voice acting of animated films. No wonder, as he has such an interesting voice. He voiced Spittle Out in How to Train Your Dragon, Charles Darwin in The Pirates in An Adventure with Scientists, Architect Droid Huyang in Star Wars The Clone Wars, and many more. The latter role earned him an Emmy in the category of Outstanding Performer in an Animated Program. Of course, his experiments were not always successful. There were also unsuccessful projects in Tennant's career. 
In 2018, there was the negatively criticized thriller Bad Samaritan and the comedy series Camping, but he somehow manages to alternate them with very good things. In the same 2018, the series was released, which according to Tennant, was one of the things he was most proud of. There She Goes was written by spouses Sean Pye and Sarah Crawford based on their real-life experience of raising a daughter who had an extremely rare chromosomal disease that affects her development. Tennant plays the role of Simon, the father of a girl with the same diagnosis. Together with his wife, he learns to accept his situation as something that cannot be changed and to look for positivity where it would seem possible to find it. The series received good ratings primarily for the fact that the creators refused to embellish the realities of parenting and marriage, but also did not turn the story into a continuous, depressive drama. I'd never read anything like it, Tennant said. As Sean rightly points out, stories about children like this are very rare, but one that was told so candidly with such rawness and truthfulness, it just felt so compelling to read. It so happened that Tennant's family had to go through an unpleasant experience that year. Georgia underwent surgery to remove some of the tissues in her cervix that were causing concern to doctors. After a while, tests showed that it was cancer. David was the first to find out about it because Georgia was nervous and asked her husband to answer the phone first when they got a call about the tests. It was a very weird experience, muses David, because we found out the bad news after it had been dealt with, so we had the relief at the same time as the horror. In 2019, the fantasy series Good Omens, based on the popular book by Neil Gaiman and the late Terry Pratchett, was launched on Amazon Prime Video. The plot centers on the demon Crowley and the angel Aziraphale, who, despite the enmity of their bosses, are trying to prevent the apocalypse. How long have we been friends? 6,000 years. Friends, we're not friends. We are an angel and a demon. We have nothing whatsoever in common. I don't even like you. You do. The novel, published in 1990, was tried several times to be adapted into a film, but something was constantly going wrong. For example, in 2002, director Terry Gilliam, whom you may know from the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, became interested in the project. Then, Robin Williams was supposed to play the role of the angel, and Johnny Depp was supposed to play the demon. However, it did not work out. When Terry was later diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, he asked Gaiman to write the screenplay himself, and it so happened that this became his dying request. I come home from the funeral and I start writing the first episode, Gaiman recalled. So, for me, it's a sort of strange process of coming to terms with my friend's death, being around him and channeling him and dealing with that. In the series, of course, there was a place for a reference to Pratchett. For example, you can see a black hat and scarf, the writer's calling card, in Aziraphale's bookstore. Tennant played a grumpy Crowley in the series, a fallen angel who actually hadn't meant to fall. He just hung around with the wrong people. Crowley loves Queen songs, his Bentley, growing plants, and hanging out with Aziraphale. Gaiman decided that David should play this role when he wrote the scene in which the demon, having entered the church, danced like a man on hot sand on the beach. Michael Sheen was paired with Tennant, and it turned out to be the best solution possible. The actors knew about each other for a long time, but never acted in common scenes. We're usually in the same casting bracket, so they'd have one or other of us, Tennant explained. We have both played Hamlet. We could have felt more competitive than we did. Chemistry immediately worked between them. I gave them good lines and Terry gave them good lines, but they brought the magic. Yeah. And they also brought a kind of, it is that chocolate and peanut butter thing where they taste good individually and you put them together and now you've got something special. Exactly. Putting them together is like Scotland's favorite actor and Wales' favorite actor together on screen for the first time. Director Douglas McKinnon added, and they were magical from the read-through forward. At the read-through, you could actually see them becoming a team. It's just there on the screen. It's a thing that you can't really specify why it works, but it just works. Over time, the actors became good friends. Um, and it was just easy, you know, it was, it was, there was no ego involved and there was, no, there was nothing extraneous. It was just the work and just having a nice time together. Uh, and then when we were in front of the camera together, it just, you know, seemed to take off and, and worked really well. And then, then we had, uh, we had our, uh, our daughters at the same time, just after Good Omens. And so our family started to become friendly. I mean, our daughters now send each other video messages oh, to wow. each other and, you know, we, um, You're tied together then. Yeah. Permanently Georgia now. has just been in the thing I've directed and um, so yeah we're so entwined now. Unlike Shane who has been a fan of the book for many years, Tennant has never heard of it and although it wasn't the first time he worked on a series with a large fan base, the actor panicked when he found out how popular the novel was. Everyone I meet goes, oh my god it's my favorite book. Suddenly you realize there's a backlash ready to come if you fuck this up. 
because I was then involved in the show, I then started meeting people who would who were going. You carry my <laughs> dreams in your hands. <laughs> this is the most important book I've ever read. This Please don't crush oh my, my heart. Exactly. And my spirit. And whilst that's terribly exciting to be to find yourself in the middle of something that people are so enthusiastic about, you it, it, there's a there's a responsibility. He was worried unnecessarily. The series not only satisfied fans of the book, but also interested a large number of new viewers who were not familiar with the work of Pratchett and Gaiman. Tennant also received a Saturn Award nomination. Also in 2019, the restless actor launched his podcast under the unpretentious title David Tennant Does a Podcast With. Among the guests of the show were many famous actors, including Whoopi Goldberg, Olivia Colman, John Hamm, Ian McKellen, and Judi Dench. Perhaps one day the biographies of these people will also appear on our channel. Click on the subscription button and the bell to avoid missing this, and we continue. It happened accidentally, starting with a conversation with my agent about my predilection for podcasts. The actor recalled the moment of the podcast's birth. Before I knew what was happening, I was in a production meeting postulating who might take part. The people I asked were keen, so suddenly I had to do it. It's been interesting to have this other life. A side hustle. In one interview, he joked that this could be a manifestation of a midlife crisis. If it is, says the actor, it's less destructive than running off with a go-go dancer or buying a sports car. And then the coronavirus happened. Well, you all remember how it started. In the spring of 2020, most people were locked in their homes. Theaters stopped working and film production stalled. The tenants spent this time at their home in Chiswick with their five children. And like all parents, they had to face the horrors of homeschooling. David recalled that in the end, his wife took matters into her own hands because she's better at organizing things than he is. You very quickly recognize the gaps in your own knowledge. The actor added, It's not, how do I do long division? It's, how do they teach long division now because it's all changed? But unlike couples for whom lockdown caused a divorce, self-isolation brought the tenant couple, on the contrary, closer together. Georgia said in an interview, I remember having the sudden realization that, oh my gosh, David's just going to be here the whole time, which obviously I'd never had before. And just thinking, that's really exciting. She thinks the secret is that they really just like each other. Even now, we like hanging out with each other more than we like hanging out with anyone else. And when all the kids are around, it's like a commune here, which I love. In fact, the more time we spend together, the more we get on, David added. Besides, in addition to the household routine, they found something to do. In April 2020, the couple began filming the experimental comedy series Staged. They were joined by Michael Sheen and his girlfriend, Anna Lindberg. Have you tried Finsbury Park? It's crappy rub sniff. I always had it. Crappy rub sniff. I shouldn't be telling you. You're the one who does it. It's not a skill set. It's a compulsion. Anna's got me painting. Oh, is she there with you? Yeah, she is. We were up early this morning to capture the dawn. All four played exaggerated versions of themselves, trying to not go crazy during lockdown, and rehearsed the play online. Although the show had screenwriters, Finn Glenn and Simon Evans, many of the lines were improvised by the actors. It's all thanks to the chemistry between the main characters. It's very nice to get to work with a friend every day. You can't pretend it's not. I mean, we did have the pleasure of doing staged during lockdown, which of course probably wouldn't have happened were it not for us getting to know each other so well on season one of Good Omens. The series was recorded using video conferencing technology and iPhones. The actors were also cameramen at the same time. If you watched the series, you might have noticed that David and Georgia are constantly changing their location in different scenes while Michael and Anna always had the same wall in the background. This was not because the tenants wanted variety. Everything was much more prosaic. The fact was that in a house with five children, it was not so easy to allocate time and place for filming. But uh, there's scenes that Georgia and I do together which would always have to be which we just do ourselves in the house and that had that that would be very tricky because you'd get the baby down for a nap you'd get one on an ipad one on a film one on a coloring book you'd have about 22 minutes to yeah. sort of there's always one you're not sure where they are isn't there no and that <laughs> if it's only one that's fine that's yeah, fine yeah you just send myrtle out to find <laughs> it was like i'd inhaled helium darling we're just in the middle of shooting sorry sorry thanks to staged the tenants slightly lifted the veil of their personal lives, which they always kept secret vigilantly. Although they wouldn't have done something like this if it weren't for the circumstances. David is convinced that he is phenomenally lucky to have had this job, given how the pandemic has affected his field of work. 
We've always been, and I don't apologize for this, quite overprotective of our family bubble, which comes from having our relationship scrutinized very early on and wanting to keep all that to ourselves. But we've been together for a long time, and maybe we're more confident about that now. They wanted the show to be as real as possible, without the idealized pictures of a family life with perfectly obedient children. But it was still important for the couple not to reveal the ins and outs of their relationship, and the characters were also not 100% consistent with the real characters of the actors. David is more pathetic than his real version, and Georgia is more indulgent of him. In the first draft of the script, I was much more supportive, Georgia recalled. David plays a more pathetic version of himself, and I just thought I would lose patience with him if he was like that, so I decided to play someone not as indulgent. Suddenly, what was intended as an attempt to pass the time on self-isolation became very popular. Although this is not surprising, because for many viewers, the situation where you are locked in four walls with your family for a long time turns out to be familiar. Where are the kids? Quiet. Are they okay? I don't know. She's not been doing school. Yeah, I finished for the day. It's like half past ten in the morning. Okay, I'm finished for the day. Therefore, the show subsequently had two more seasons no less funny and interesting. In 2020, two more TV series were also released, which were filmed before the pandemic began. The first was the drama Deadwater Fell, about a doctor who lost his wife and children in a fire. Tennant acted not only as the lead actor, but also as the producer of the series. Critics rated the series positively, but the second show of that year, called Des, made more noise. That's because Tennant played a real-life serial killer, Dennis Nilsson, there. Many years ago, when Tennant moved to London from Scotland and rented an apartment in Crouch End, a roommate gave him a book. It was Killing for Company by Brian Masters, which was just about Nilsson. This choice of gift will not seem strange if you know the fact that the actor and his neighbor lived near the house where Nilsson committed his crimes. I remember reading it and just being appalled, Tennant said. And years later, he returned to this book, but in order to prepare for the role. The actor also watched an interview with Nielsen, talked to the police officers involved in the case, and with Brian Masters, who corresponded with the serial killer for many years for his book. He also read a little of what Nielsen himself had written. Ghastly, self-serving, egotistical nonsense was the actor's verdict. Tennant said the production team had not wanted to tell a titillating and sensationalist story, but it was important to continue to tell stories about how badly it can go and how dysfunctional some of our human brethren can become. During filming, the actor was more distant from the team than usual. He didn't want to be larky on the set because he felt he had to take the story very seriously. The excitement for his one-year-old daughter, Birdie, who was very ill at that time, was added to this. David was on a night shoot when he found out that the child had been taken to the hospital. At the beginning, we were a bit like, She's fine. It's like a bit of a cold. It's not a problem. Georgia recalled. Within 24 hours, it was, No, we're not fine. It's a bit more serious. Within three days, we got into intensive care. There was a long period of time when her parents were afraid that they would lose her. Even after Birdie was taken home, they worried about her condition for a long time. Fortunately, the baby recovered. As for Des, the series was rated mostly positively, especially Tenet was praised. For example, Thomas Ling from Radio Times believed that this was one of his best roles in his entire impeccable career. And Carol Midgley in the Times of London wrote that, quote, to make a character simultaneously dull and mesmerizing takes quite some talent. The actor received an International Emmy Award for Best Actor. In 2021, the actor could be seen in the series Around the World in 80 Days, based on the novel The Same Name by Jules Verne. This project was special for him because David's eldest son, Ty, got a small role there, although this was not the first appearance of his children on the screen. Olive played in Kenneth Branagh's Oscar-winning film Belfast at the age of 10 and Ty in the Channel 4 drama Consent, but this was the first time that Tennant Sr. played with his child in the same project. The cooperation between father and son did not end there. In the second season of Good Omens, which was released in 2023, Ty again got a small role in scenes shared with David. But that's not all. Peter Davidson also got to shoot the same scenes. One of Job's sons is played by a very promising young actor called Ty Tennant. He's got a great future ahead of him, I hope, because I'm hoping he'll uh, pay for my old folks' home when uh, I retire. David is not against his children trying out for the movies, but he can't help but worry about their future. In an interview, the actor admitted, Your heart's in your mouth when you think. What if they can't do it? What if they turn up and it's all a bit embarrassing. 
It's a great relief when you realize they're good, because while having parents in the industry might initially get you in a door, if you can't do it after that, it ain't going to happen. That's as it should be. This is an oversubscribed industry, and you've got to earn your place. In 2022, Tennant appeared as himself in the comedy series Meet the Richardsons and played the vicar in Stephen Moffat's dramatic thriller Inside Man. In addition, he got the main role in the series Litvininko, which told about the real case of poisoning by Russian special services of former Russian intelligence officer Alexander Litvininko. And in the following year, he returned. In 2023, fans of The Doctor received a big gift in the form of a three-part special for the 60th anniversary of the series, in which David and Catherine Tate returned to their roles for a while. Talks about Tennant playing the Time Lord again, if at least for a short time, have been going on for a long time. This became possible, among other things, due to the fact that Russell T. Davies became the showrunner of the series again. The actor couldn't tell much about the filming. It's been a while. Um, mm. 15 years or so. Yeah, but I, I just wanted to make sure I could still run as fast. And I seem to have got away with it. But obviously, David was delighted with the shooting. It was not just a job for money, but also an opportunity to be back in the universe that had meant so much to him since childhood. The real answer is that I still love it. You do spend your years away from Doctor Who, always watching it, always thinking of ideas, thinking about how I would expand it, thinking of stories. It never goes away. I have been inventing stories in my head ever since I was about six, so when I left the show, that doesn't stop. It's not surprising that David brought his own ideas to the story while working on the specials. For example, there was a phrase in the regeneration scene that David himself suggested adding. I know these teeth. It referred to the scene after the regeneration of the ninth doctor at the tenth. Hello. Okay. New teeth. That's weird. So where was I? That's rather nice, isn't it? Russell commented on this idea. I like that. I was really chuffed. In 2023, it also became known that Tennant would play the main role in the play Macbeth. Apparently, the actor decided to embody all the main characters of Shakespeare on stage. Despite the fact that he has decades of work in the theater under his belt, David is still worried before going on stage. The whole challenge is convincing yourself that you're not going to forget your lines or wet yourself or whatever. You start rehearsing these little speeches in your head where you have to apologize to the audience because you can't carry on and you're going to have to go to your dressing room and have a little cry. Actors are known to be superstitious, but Tennant tries not to be like that. Nevertheless, he has his own rituals. Before a performance, he usually listens to a music album and it is selected randomly for each play. For example, it was a Coldplay album for Hamlet, and it was David Bowie's Nothing Has Changed for Richard II. And even if it gets boring, David continues to listen to it every night. It's probably his way of calming down. Tennant has been suffering from anxiety since childhood. He always felt insecure about himself, and that's partly why he became an actor, to hide behind the mask of someone else. At the same time, he is haunted by the fear of not meeting expectations, not being able to cope with work in a very competitive industry. It's worrying about not being good enough, about being found out, about not being worthy as an actor. When you're making a living at it and so many friends aren't, it makes you feel guilty. I mean, John Hamm couldn't get a job until he was 30. It could easily have not happened for him. He would just be an incredibly good-looking Uber driver. Anxiety is also the reason why he doesn't have a social media account. Although there is a suspicion that this is also because he does not understand modern technology at all, which is confirmed by some videos. MySpace, that still exist? No. <laughs> no. Oh, it does. Well, it does, but well, nobody's on it anymore. <laughs> Do I have any social media? MySpace. Hello, Marvel fans on Snapchat. I neither know what a snap nor a chat is, but may your chat be snappy. Hello, InstaFace. <laughs> Hi. Hello, MySpace. Welcome to the internet. <laughs> I do, yes. Okay, then I have no idea how that passed you by. That's weird. <laughs> because, because I thought the emojis were just meant to represent what they represented. I didn't know it was this whole kind of other language you had to learn. Well, all right. The actor believes that he would worry whether the text of his posts is wittily written enough or whether his moral position on any issue is clearly expressed. He would worry so much that it would paralyze him. I'm a good bluffer, says David. I am a worrier, but I'm quite good at shielding it from the outside world. 
I think I surprise people, apart from those closest to me, when they find out I'm quite an anxious person. Fortunately for fans, Georgia provides them with content with Tenet outside of work. We normally go to well, one you're proposing specific. you post this in some sort of public forum. Yeah, uh, we normally go to one I'm specific Morrison's, um, but we've discovered that there's another one. So we're going to give it a go. Are you excited? I'm excited. So far, the actor has managed to overcome his anxiety and continue to work hard. The only thing that can make him slow down is his family. Lately, the actor has been trying to be more selective in his work because he feels guilty for not spending as much time with children as he would like. But at the same time, he strives to instill in them a work ethic. Supporting a big family in London isn't cheap, so work is important financially, the actor believes. David Tennant has played bad guys on stage and screen more than once, but in life, he tries to be extremely polite to everyone, and people reciprocate it. Lovely, lovely faces. He has been supporting worldwide cancer research for many years and is a supporter of the LGBTQ community. Tennant is afraid of becoming a prima donna, the only thing the actor allows himself to spend more on than he thinks he should, besides bright socks of course, is flying. You are unlikely to see him in economy class. When you're on set you have to be looked after because it's practical, but it's a short step to thinking, no, I have to be looked after because I'm important. You see people sliding into that, and you never want that to happen, he says. We are sure that David Tennant has many diverse and interesting roles ahead, and there are years of hard work under his belt that have paid off in full. Watching movies starring the actor, he will laugh and cry, love and hate his characters. But what is definitely impossible to do is to forget him. While we're waiting for new performances from the actor, we invite you to learn more about other equally interesting figures of cinema. Click on the video that appears on your screen and watch, but before that, don't forget to like it. It was Biographer with you. Thank you for your attention and see you later.